Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for uh, coming to spend part of your uh, Saturday with us. We're very excited. My name is Eddie Ibrahim, and I'm the Senior Director of Programming for Comic-Con. Um, so on behalf of the museum, we definitely thank you. Out of curiosity, how many of you are charter members or are members of the museum? Okay, great, great. So as you can expect, sometimes there's a little bit of a pitch, but um, I do want to make sure that uh, uh, if you guys uh, are enjoying these types of events, of which we hope to have many, many more, uh, please uh, at least take a, a look at uh, getting a charter membership at the table. Um, obviously, uh, fan support is really what's going to allow us to do these types of events as well as, as bigger and better things. So again, if you have that opportunity, please don't hesitate to take a look and uh, see what uh, benefits a charter membership will get you for that. Oh, oh yeah, well, there's a t-shirt, there's also lanyards, there's a bunch of stuff, but we're not here for that. We're here for, for uh, this gentleman here. So um, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Josh Agel, who is known around the world as Shag. He is the, one of the, he is the first artist that has had an exhibit here at the Comic-Con Museum, as well as doing an exclusive uh, for the Comic-Con Museum, which we have here for you guys to look at, uh, which is titled, and forgive me, The Thrilling Threesome Plus One. And it was a limited edition run of only 175. And uh, if you're interested, we actually still do have um, some left, and if you'd like, they are available for purchase uh, as a suggested donation uh, uh, upstairs as well. Um, when you walk through the gallery upstairs, you will notice that Josh's work is a blend of pop culture, tiki culture, and an unmistakable mid-century aesthetic that reminds us of animation and advertising in the 50s and 60s. Josh works with Disney and has been commissioned by countless other companies to create masterpieces. He had solo exhibitions throughout the world, and his artwork, artwork hangs on every continent. So at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Josh Agel, otherwise known as Shag. Thanks, Eddie. Hey, thank you, guys. First of all, I want to uh, thank the museum for inviting me to do this. Uh, I don't get that many opportunities to talk. I do it a couple times a year at universities and art schools, but uh, I'd rather talk to a group of people like you who are not art students, because I don't have to get super technical. Uh, as they said, my name is Shag. That's my artist name. My real name is Josh Hagel. Uh, for those of you on social media, um, see if my clicker is working here. There we go. <laughs> I got to get used to this thing. You can just, you can do hashtag shag if you want. Uh, and uh, when I meet people in new situations, like if I'm at a party, people often be, they'll say, oh, this is shag, he's an artist. And people will say, oh, what do you do? And then the person I'm with will always say, oh, you've seen his work, which seems to be the common refrain when, when, when I'm meeting new people. Uh, I'm known for colorful sort of vintage inspired scenes of tiki bars cocktail parties, palm springs, sort of architectural scenes, bachelor pad fantasies. Um, and probably outside of my own art, the thing I'm best known for is uh, collaborating with Disney. I've worked with Disney uh, for about 17 years. Uh, and they usually call me when they're having an anniversary or something for one of their attractions at Disneyland. Uh, and they'll engage me to create some artwork for that. For example, this is the 40th anniversary of the Haunted Mansion. And I did 13 paintings to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Haunted Mansion in 2009. Um, they, they originally called me in 2002 to see if I would be interested in doing something for the Enchanted Tiki Room which makes sense. The 40th anniversary of the Enchanted Tiki Room was coming up. So uh, of course, how could I say no? More Disney stuff. I was one of two official artists for Disneyland's 50th birthday in 2005, which is fitting because my mother actually went to Disneyland the day before it opened. Um, there was a VIP preview day. And her dad, who was also an artist, had kind of some connections at the Disney art department and pulled some strings and got her a pass to the day before it opened. So of course, when I got this, I totally pumped her on it. And she was like, I, I don't remember anything about it. <laughs> 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 uh, 
she was she was a fifteen year old girl at the time, so you know it it didn't leave the kind of impression on her that it would have left on me. Uh, I've also worked with uh, fashion designers and clothing companies. Paul Frank, uh, you probably saw that monkey around a lot in the early 2000s. He was everywhere. I didn't come up with the monkey. Uh, Paul Frank actually came up with the monkey, but he's a good friend, uh, and we've collaborated over the years. Playboy, I did this for the uh, anniversary of the Playboy Bunnies for Playboy, and this was exhibited at the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. Uh, as well as they allowed me to release it as a print myself. I worked with Coca-Cola. Pink Panther. Uh, MGM Studios asked me to redesign the Pink Panther for one year only in 2003 for his 40th birthday. So I made him more like a cat. He didn't walk on two legs. Uh, he still smoked and drank, though, <laughs> because that's a big part of my art. Going the wrong way. Uh, this is uh, a collaboration I did with Stan Lee, one of the last projects he worked on before he passed away. Uh, and he only had one request. He wanted to be put in the artwork. <laughs> Just like his movies, you know, he wanted a cameo. So I mocked this thing up, you know, sent it to him. I said, you know, I was, well, first I asked him, what do you want me to do? And he said, do whatever you want to do. You know, well, thanks for the art direction, Stan. <laughs> so I researched uh, one of my big childhood uh, pleasures was the Spider-Man cartoon. So I kind of wanted it to be based on the Spider-Man cartoon I had seen as a kid. You all know the song, Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Um, and then I had to research which villains Stan had come up with. And I wanted to put my favorite villains that he had created into the picture as well. And when I sent him the the my mock-up, he looked at it, he says, oh, it's great, don't change a thing. And that was it. That's how it is to work with Stan Lee, apparently. <laughs> this is something I did for Lucasfilm. Uh, and they actually came to me with the idea. And when they told me the idea, I, was, I felt really stupid that I hadn't thought of it. You know, <laughs> I'm a huge Star Wars fan. I actually, the first time I ever heard of Star Wars was a radio commercial when I was riding to junior high on the school bus and they played sounds of TIE fighters and imperial, imperial ships and then the voiceover said, don't be alarmed, that's just a TIE fighter, don't be alarmed, it's this. And I'm like, my ears perked up, you know, as like a 12 year old, I'm like, ooh. And then they said, coming in June or in May, Star Wars. And I remember thinking, Star Wars, what a dumb name for a movie. <laughs> that's like calling a movie Car Chase. Well, then a, a few weeks later, I was at the theater watching Jabberwocky, which is uh, a movie that came out in 1977. And they had a preview for Star Wars. And I knew it was going to be the best movie ever made. And I was pretty much right. Uh, so I was one of those people that stood in line for the very first matinee of the very first showing of Star Wars, sat in that theater. Seen the, I'd seen the, uh, the, the movie previews, but I had no idea what to expect. And then that lettering starts crawling up into space. And somebody in the back of the movie theater yelled, OK, we read the book. Now let's watch the movie. <laughs> and I remember thinking, there's a Star Wars book? Why didn't I know about this? <laughs> you know, I was a, just a kid. But <laughs> so on this piece, uh, I, I did what I usually do, which is come up with a color comp and send it to Lucasfilm. And they only had two requests. They said, will you put the devil guy in? Because I hadn't put the devil guy in because I wanted Christians to buy this as well. <laughs> and they said, we really want to see the devil guy. Plus, it's really just a cheesy off-the-shelf mask, you know. Uh, so I put the devil guy in. And originally, I had Greedo in the foreground where the devil guy was. And they said, and can we have Greedo and Han Solo, you know, having their conversation? I'm like, no, that can't happen because that's not how it happened in the movie. In the movie... How did I get there? <laughs> you know, Luke and the robots walk in, and then Obi-Wan tries to, you know, does his little thing. And then at the end of that scene, that's when Greedo and the whole thing happens. And they said, nobody's going to care. They just want to see Han Solo and Greedo together. <laughs> so 
I acquiesced. <laughs> so that's what Shag is known for. <laughs> Actually, my, I, uh, my attorney came to me a few years ago and he said, like, you're kind of getting popular. I think you need to trademark that name. So I did, and I've never, I've never done anything with that except I have the right to put a little TM next to my name, which I don't do because <laughs> it seems a little, I don't know, uh, a little too corporate, I guess. So <laughs> we'll do without it. Uh, I also do a lot of merchandise. I put my art on a lot of things, and this goes back to the early days when I was an artist, because I would go to the museum, and you know, I'd look around at like the Getty Museum, and they'd have a, a, a Van Gogh exhibit or something. Then you'd go to the gift sh shop, and there'd be all these cheap things with Van Gogh's images on them. And I thought, you know, if you're an artist and you're around for any amount of time, eventually your stuff's going to be put on things. So I wanted to kind of take control of that myself and say, yes, it can go on that. No, it can't go on that. And I have kind of one big criteria about what I'll put my art on. It's either got to be A, useful, or B, art. And there are a few things that are neither of those things. For example, I consider a snow globe neither useful nor art. So there, at least not while I'm living, there will never be a shag snow globe. <laughs> One of, the, one, of my, uh, one of the companies I worked with in the 2000s, a, a card company, a greeting card company, actually they met with me and they sprang it on me, a shag snow globe that they had, you know, they just made one to try and sell me on the idea. And I hadn't talked to them about my philosophy and I was like, no, that's not going to happen. And I remember the, the president of the company is like, okay, I'm just going to have a really expensive snow globe then. <laughs> Some more products. These, these are actually coming out this month. These are silk ties, uh, which will be a, available through the Shag store. Some nods to sort of some, some retro things from my childhood. Remember the clock with the wagging tail? That's the Shag version. Toys, I've done toys as well. So after having been an artist for about uh, probably 12 or 13 years, uh, somebody in Palm Springs approached me, uh, somebody who owned a gallery I'd been showing at, and he said, I just got this space on Palm Canyon Drive, which is the main street in town. Would you like to open up your own gallery? And I said yes. And the main reason I said yes, I just wanted to design the inside of the store. You know, <laughs> like I didn't know how it would go over, but I thought it would be a, a fun project just to design what the inside of the store looked like. So that opened up about 10 years ago, and it slowly uh, increased in popularity, and we've expanded the store a few times, and now it's about four times as big as the original store. Uh, this gives me an outlet to sell all those crazy things I make, the neckties and the skateboards and the lamps and things like that. The other thing I like to do is limited edition products. So it's not something that's going to be there forever. It's not something that we made 100,000 of. It's something we made a thousand of, and the only place you can get it is, is the Shag store or the other Shag store, which is on Melrose in West Hollywood, which I also said yes to because I wanted to design another store. <laughs> it's a photo of it. That's the inside of the, one of the Shag stores. I also didn't want to call it the Shag Gallery. I wanted to call it the store for a couple reasons. A lot of times artists who have their own gallery are maybe not the kind of artists I necessarily want to be associated with, like Thomas Kincaid. Do any of you know who Thomas Kincaid is? Yeah, Thomas Kincaid. Um, other artists, you know, I'm not too keen on that. And the other thing is, a lot of people who won't walk into a gallery will walk into a store. So if we called it the Shag Store, I was hoping more people who didn't know what it was would walk in. Plus, we sell merchandise, we sell socks, we sell towels, a lot of other things besides art. And one of my philosophies in having the store is I want there to be something new in there every time somebody goes into the store. But I'm going to back up even farther to where it all began. This is probably what you guys came for. Oh, one more thing. Shag Store mostly sells silkscreen prints. That's, that's the reason we founded it, to sell the silkscreen print editions. Uh, that's a pretty big silkscreen that just came out. Anyway, where it all started, Hawaii, believe it or not. 
I spent the first eight years of my life in Hawaii. I wasn't born in Hawaii, but my parents moved there when I was six months old. People always ask, oh, your dad was in the military. No, my dad was an accountant. And his firm went to him and said, okay, we got a couple openings, Indianapolis, Des Moines, Honolulu. And he's like, you know, what would you say? <laughs> so, so I lived in Honolulu for the, the, the first eight years of my life, surrounded by great tropical sort of mid-century graphics like that. How cool is that map? How could you not want to live at a place like that? with giant fish in the sea and <laughs> King Kamehameha standing on a little island off, off the south of your island. See if you can spot me in my uh, preschool <laughs> class. <laughs> that's, where, that's where we lived. Little house on the hill with great views of the city. The view of the city is something you're going to see a lot in my own art. Maybe it stems from that. I remember looking out that window once and seeing a fire and telling my mom I saw a fire and she called the fire department and a fire tr truck came up and put it out. That's why you need a view. <laughs> Always entertaining. More mid-century graphics that are kind of going to go on to influence me. And we lived right, we lived in a neighborhood ca called Kahala, which is outside of Waikiki. So the, you know, that's where we went. We, we needed to go to shopping. We went to the beach. Uh, the beach we always went to was Queen Surf. They even had their own cool logo with, with tiki torches. So all this stuff and the surrounding architecture is, is making an impression on me as a little kid. It's a resort. More sort of Hawaii modernism. This kind of stuff, you know, at the time as a kid, that's all I knew. But it was everywhere. It surrounded me. And it's going to kind of make this this sort of like hole in my head. It's going to kind of crouch in back dormant for a long time. That's why we went shopping, Ala Moana Shopping Center. See that, that tall building? It's got a rotating restaurant on top. I love rotating restaurants to this day. And man, the hot dog they serve there. You would not believe it. <laughs> it's inside that same shopping center. Or if my mom was feeling a little adventurous, we'd go to the International Marketplace which you would shop you know, with these guys serenading you. And in the international marketplace, there was also Trader Vic's, which is sort of the eight-year-old's first awareness of, of cocktails, tropical cocktails. My parents never went there, but I walked by it. And kind of hanging over all of Honolulu was the, uh, the Dole Cannery. And above the Dole Cannery, kind of like an omnipotent god was the giant pineapple <laughs> sort of overseeing everything, like, like Sauron over. Uh, uh, <laughs> There's a great shot of the pineapple. Um, and it was during my childhood that certain things kind of, certain pop culture things made an impression on me. Hawaii Five-0, obviously, because it was filmed in our neighborhood. In fact, they filmed an episode three, day, three doors down from me once. And it was just uh, Jack Lord playing McGarrett, pulling into the driveway of this house and walking inside. But he had to do it four times, which amazed me as a kid. You know, you remember the, his big black Mercury marquee? Pull into the driveway, get out, walk into the front door, walk out, get into the car, pull out of the driveway, pull into the driveway, get out, walk into the front door. <laughs> they did that four times. Elvis. Elvis was big in Hawaii. Elvis and Jack Lord, and I don't know who that is in the middle. <laughs> Phyllis Diller, maybe? Or... <laughs> Supervillains. Uh, that was McGarrett's uh, sort of biggest supervillain in Hawaii Five-0, Woe Fat, sort of the supervillain who explained the plot before it happened and then escaped in the end always. That's the first grown-up movie I've ever saw, I ever saw, actually, in Hawaii. My parents took me to a double feature of You Only Live Twice and Thunderball in our station wagon at the drive-in movie theater. They even had drive-in movie theaters in Hawaii. Pull the station wagon in backwards, make a little bed in the back, watch the movie. So this was my first introduction to grown-up life, you know, how grown-ups lived. 
at least, at least grown-ups outside of my own parents. So it was, it was eye-opening. I, I couldn't wait to grow up. <laughs> of course, the supervillain lair. This is the supervillain from You Only Live Twice. It's got a little pond there with a bridge over it. Pond's full of piranhas. Somebody he doesn't like walks over the, the bridge. It's got a little button he pushes with his foot. The bridge opens up. They get eaten by piranhas. Stereotypical supervillain. Also the, the basis for Dr. Evil in the, in the uh, Austin Powers movies. I looked up that chair once. I, I, I had this idea. I wanted that chair in my house, and I found out that there's a company in Great Britain that still makes those chairs. I never got it because it was like $2,000, but it's kind of cool. But the other kind of competing sort of influence in my childhood which was the polar opposite of James Bond and Steve McGarrett from Hawaii Five-0 and supervillains was the fact that I was raised as a Mormon. So a very strict Mormon. And, and being raised as a Mormon, there's no smoking, there's no drinking. Uh, you're not supposed to have sex till you're married. Um, we have, the Mormons had their own set of scriptures, and the ones I, my family had as a kid had these illustrations, which are kind of like almost uh, fantasy illustrations. I, I don't know if there are any LDS people in the audience. I'm not saying your religion is fantasy. I'm just saying it kind of looks like fantasy. There's another one. How great is that? Yeah, that's uh, an illustrated happening from, from the Book of Mormon. More of that stuff. That, it's like Frank Frazetta meets some historical painter or something. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Maxwell Parrish. That's the LA Temple, which is done in sort of cocktail lounge high modern style. If the church ever goes bankrupt, I think that would really make an awesome nightclub. <laughs> so in keeping with being raised as a Mormon, when you're 19, they, they pack you up and they ship you off and, and you become a Mormon missionary, which I did when I was 19. I was sent to Germany. I didn't have any pictures of myself on a bike, so I just had to pick some <laughs> stock photo of some Mormon missionaries on a bike. I did have a bike, and you should have seen my calves after, after my mission. But being out there, kind of made re me realize that wasn't really my thing. I, I, I had always been a skeptic, and, and that kind of uh, was kind of the final, the final nail in the coffin when I saw the big, wide world out there of people who weren't Mormons having fulfilled lives and believing whatever they believed. Uh, so I kind of stepped away from that religion a couple years later, right around the time I turned 21, which meant it was time to start going to the bars. <laughs> so I had a group of two friends. We loved going to what we called old man bars, which was our term for a bar that was unchanged from the 50s or 60s, and usually the only clientele was old men. And our favorite old man bars were the tiki old man bars. So we loved the tiki bars more than anything, especially because you'd go, you'd order your Mai Tai. If you paid an extra $5, you got to keep the ceramic mug it came in. So that sort of became our souvenir for an evening, you know. We'd go to Bahuka, or we'd go to Tiki Tea, we'd buy the drink, we'd buy the mug, we'd come home, put it on a shelf, have a little memento of your evening. And then I decided, mm, I like these things. I'd noticed they were in thrift stores and flea markets, so I started buying them. At the same time, my friends started buying them, so it became this competition which is the best way to collect something if you are competing with somebody else you know collecting the same thing. So it, you know, it spurred me on to get more mugs. This is probably a fifth of my mug collection. And these are almost all vintage mugs. I stopped collecting in about the year 2000. But for my honeymoon, my wife and I drove up the coast of California, hit every tiki bar between San Diego and San Francisco, and got the mugs that they had. And that was my honeymoon. <laughs> so, you know, I'm wandering around thrift stores looking for tiki mugs, and I notice the records. 
And, you know, I, I especially like them for the covers. Just the, you know, often a beautiful exotic woman, some sort of cool setting, uh, bachelor pad setting. <laughs> but check out the trophies. <laughs> So you'd buy one of these records, you'd bring it home, you'd put it on. They were usually really bad, you know. Elliot Lawrence, he's like a third-rate Lawrence Welk, who isn't very good himself, in my opinion. So, but the covers, something about those covers really appealed to me. That lifestyle, you know. Your, your hi-fi, your beautiful women, your trophy heads. <laughs> the ultimate bachelor pad, that, that sort of became my obsession. You know, when I got my first apartment, like, you know, how could I make it look like something like that? You know, we strived to have our apartments look like that. Or that. But usually they ended up looking like that. <laughs> so when I got my first apartment, I noticed from going to all those thrift stores and flea markets, there was a lot of old furniture. And back then, this is the late 80s. There was a lot of old furniture from the 50s and 60s. So I furnished my first apartment for about $200. It was all 50s and 60s furniture. Uh, look, you'd step in, it looked like a magazine from 1964. People would come over and they'd just be like, their mouths would drop. They couldn't believe it. And I'd be like, yeah, $200. <laughs> That's what I wish it looked like. It did not look like that. By the way, that's Case Study House 21 in LA. I had an acquaintance who owned that house for a while, and he sold it, and I asked him, why did he sell it? You know, it's all walls of glass. You drive by in the street, you can see what's going on inside. He said, well, one of the reasons is I hung a painting in my living room, and then two days later, there was a knock on the door, and it was Pierre Koenig, the architect of the house, telling me to take the painting down. <laughs> so that's the perils of living in glass houses, I guess. <laughs> So uh, I went to university. I ultimately graduated with an art degree. I went to Cal State Long Beach, the big blue pyramid, although there were no art classes in that. It seems like the appropriate place to have the art classes. That's actually a sports arena. Uh, and I had originally been going to the university studying accounting. But after a couple of years of accounting, which is pretty easy but not very interesting, I was sitting in class one day and some students came in and they said, we're here, to, we're here to talk to you about the Accounting Student Softball League. We want you to join. And I remember thinking, like, who would want to, who would want to play softball with a bunch of accounting students? And then I was like, wait a minute. You know, that self-aware moment. So I went to the counselor and I changed my major to art, which I had <laughs> loved since a little kid, since I was a little kid. And in college, I specialized in, uh, my main focus was in silkscreen prints and printmaking. That's a print I did in college. That's a mono print. It's a painting I did in college, self-portrait with the little <laughs> cut off just before grunge was bubbling up. So, some silkscreen work I did in univers at the university. Now, I, I didn't tell you this, but as part of being a Mormon, you have like nine brothers and sisters, generally, or six or something. I had nine brothers and sisters, so we had to pay our way through college. And the way I did that was as a graphic designer and freelance illustrator. So even when I was studying accounting, I was doing art to pay my way through college. And mostly what I was doing was graphic design for punk rock records, punk rock labels. This is some of the work I did. Not at all shag-like, but... It paid the bills. I got to design a Sex Pistols box set. This is stuff I was getting paid for, but I, I had friends in the record industry who had labels and bands. And for not getting paid, I would do their album covers, which kind of leaned more towards my taste in art, which is something hearkening back to the 50s or 60s. That's, I did that in the mid-90s. and then I released it as a variation of that as a silkscreen print uh, in 2019. You can see it out there at the museum. 
another, you know, the tiki stuff coming in. Ed Big Daddy Roth, the monsters with the tongues hanging out of their head. This stuff is, I'm starting to get paid to do stuff like this. And I can work in a lot of different styles, which is one of the reasons they had hired me. They'd say, oh, I want this cover to look like a board game, or I want this cover to look like a pinup magazine. Uh, and, but in the meantime, I had my own little style I like to work in. And, it, and that is the very first time I used it. And that was in 19, I think I did that in 1988 or 89. And it was based on advertising illustration from the 50s and 60s, maybe some like animated films you saw in school, like a film about space or something would be done in this style. Um, some jazz album covers sort of had a style like this. And I don't know, I just fell in love with this, this, that look, which is sort of flat areas of color, sharp lines, sort of a almost cubic effect, cubist effect where you take a shape and you really simplify it down. And so uh, that was sort of the genesis of Shag. In fact, this was done for uh, the album cover of a band I was in myself. And I thought it would be really unprofessional if people picked up the album and saw that the guitar player had done the album cover illustration. So I thought, I got to come up with a name. I got to come up with a, it was either come up with a name for myself as a guitar player or come up with a name for myself as an artist. And so that's where Shag came up, came from. I had to come up with something. And Shag is really just that. And I liked it because it had a lot of meanings, you know. There's the carpet, there's a dance, there's the British, you know, Austin Powers. Which, by the way, when that movie came out, for like three years, every time I picked up my phone, hey, Shagadelic, shag me, baby. <laughs> That's all I heard. Like, people, were, people thought they were the first one who, to, to have ever thought of that. Fortunately, it died down. I don't get that anymore. So I'm working as this commercial illustrator in the, in the record industry. I do that for about eight years, and occasionally people would ask me, hey, I saw you did this record. Can I buy the artwork for it? Uh, and I'd usually tell them, well, I don't have that art. It either went to the record label or it was done mechanically, which is where you do it in black and white, and then the colors added in the printing process. You know, For various reasons, I didn't really have a lot of original art. And finally, a friend of mine uh, by the name of Otto von Stroheim called me and said, hey, you're going to have to make some paintings. I booked you an art show. And I'm like, oh, all right, you know. The art show turned out to be one wall at a coffee house in Santa Monica. That coffee house is about the size of the bedroom, so I got one bedroom wall. And I thought, well, nobody's going to buy these, so I, I want to do some paintings that will look good in my own apartment. <laughs> um, so I sat down, and I'm like, what would the ultimate painting I'd like in my apartment? So I painted a painting. That was the first painting I did for that art show. And I thought, yeah, that'll look good in my apartment. My carpet was about the same color as the ground there in the, in the painting. So like, I even did, I even did it so it would like match my the colors in my apartment. Obviously, Trader Vic's going back to my childhood. You know, the, uh, the influence is bubbling up. That's the second painting I did. Well. I did five paintings, and strangely enough, they all sold. So, I, so they never ended up hanging on my wall. I priced them at $200 and $300, $300 being the maximum I could ever picture myself paying for an original painting. So like, you know, somebody came up to me with an Andy Warhol original painting and said, that's $305. I would have been like, eh, sorry. $300 is my limit. So. Shortly after this painting, where, this show where I did five paintings on the wall of a coffee house, Otto von Stroheim called me up again and he said, hey, I'm curating a, a show at a gallery. It's a tiki art theme show. Do you want to be part of it? And I'm like, yeah, what's the gallery? And he said, it's La Luz de Jesus Gallery in LA, uh, which uh, it's kind of a gallery, gift store, bookstore, soap plant, all kind of wrapped up in one on Hollywood Boulevard. So it was also sort of the most seminal gallery in LA at the time for artists who were kind of out of the mainstream. So I'm not going to be showing it at some gallery in, uh, well, I'm trying to think. 
on La Cienega, say, in LA, which is where all the high-end galleries were. This is up on Hollywood Boulevard. It's a little more pop culture oriented. So when he said the show was going to be there, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I want, to, I want to have a painting in that place. So he said, well, you have to take slides of your paintings, and then you ship them, you mail them to the gallery, and the gallery director will look at them, and if she wants any of them, she'll call you. And I'm like, ooh, OK, big time. So I, you know, I take slides of all my paintings. I, I buy one of those plastic sleeves, put the little slides in it, you know, go to get an, a manila envelope, a little cardboard. I want this to be professional. And I took pictures of six paintings, sent them to her. And then a week later, uh, she calls me. She's like, OK, you're in. I'm like, yeah, which painting did you pick? And she's like, all of them. So I was like, oh, cool. Uh, so I sent the six paintings up to the show. And uh, all six paintings sold. And so, of course, the guy who owned the gallery was like, hmm, who is this shag guy? Up till then, the gallery had been more known for lowbrow art, which is sort of um, hot rods and naked girls. Uh, this is Robert Williams, who's the, the godfather of lowbrow art. Have any of you seen his work? Yeah. Are you aware of Robert Williams? Um, an artist named Coop. More hot rods and naked girls. And I remember thinking, like, when the gallery owner asked me if I wanted to have a show there, I don't paint hot rods or naked girls. Is this going to work? Well, he probably had dollar signs in his eye. That's a Joel Coleman painting also from the same gallery. So it wasn't all hot rods and naked girls, but it wasn't at all shag. So I painted some paintings, and I had, I had my first show there. You know, typical kind of shag paintings. By the way, the first five paintings I did were all tiki bar scenes. And then the six paintings I did for that show were tiki's. Uh, but after a couple of weeks, I was like, I got to expand my repertoire. I can't be painting tiki bars the whole time. So I looked around my apartment. And I was like, eh, what else can I paint? The Invisible Man. <laughs> and then kind of the furniture I was surrounded by, so kind of the, the bachelor pad lifestyle, which began to expand in my repertoire. Pineapples show up a lot in my art, you know, hearkening back to my childhood god. More pineapples. Even more pineapples. <laughs> and other things from my childhood. Thunderbirds, kind of super marionation. And a couple years before this happened, uh, a new magazine had been launched called Juxtapose which was sort of supposed to feature all the artists who weren't featured in the high-end magazines like Art News or Art in America. And over time, this became the art magazine with the largest circulation in the world. But at this time, it had just, they'd only had a few issues. Uh, it was founded by these three men, Robert Williams, the artist I had shown you, the girl on the taco, uh, Greg Escalante, and Fausto, who had a skateboard magazine called Thrasher. These three men founded the magazine. Uh, two of them have passed away, unfortunately. Robert Williams is still alive. Uh, Robert Williams hated my art. <laughs> and he, he went into the, the juxtaposed magazine offices. And he's from Oklahoma, so he's got this sort of like Midwestern, Southern drawl. And he said, Shag will never be on the cover of juxtaposed magazine while I'm alive. So I was banned from the magazine before I even was anything. And, and I'm not exactly sure why he didn't. Well, I do know why he didn't like my art, because he would write editorials in the magazine without using my name, describing my art, and saying my art was too nice, too pretty, too beautiful, and then closing off his editorial saying, it reminds me of another failed artist who uh, painted pretty pictures, Adolf Hitler. <laughs> So I'm like, wow, he's really taking this serious. He, he really doesn't like my art. So when Juxtapose had their 10th anniversary in, I think it was about 2006 or 2007, uh, the man in the middle asked me if I would submit a painting to the art show. And I said yes. And I was like, wait, Robert Williams is always bugging me that my art's not nice enough. So I decided to do a painting of Robert Williams. <laughs> Yeah.
you know, I, he doesn't want me to be nice. I'll, I'll do a painting where I'm not nice. So this hung in the show, and actually, before Robert Williams even got to see what the painting was, Greg Escalante in the middle, he dragged Robert Williams over and me to get a picture in front of it because he knew as soon as Robert Williams saw it, he would hit the roof. <laughs> and he did hit the roof. He was really, really angry, and his wife was even angrier. And she demanded, she demanded the gallery take the painting off the wall, but the gallery said no. So, yeah. But really, I didn't feel that way about Robert Williams. I, he was a big influence, maybe not specifically visually, but the way he lived his life and the way he ran his art career. I looked at him for inspiration. So a few years later, when La Luz de Jesus Gallery, that gallery I'd been showing at, had their 20th anniversary, I decided to do a loving tribute to Robert Williams. And this is called Carne de Amor, which is also the name of the painting he did with the girl on the taco. That's the first naked girl on a taco I've ever painted. <laughs> Probably the last I'll ever paint. So you know Tiki influenced me. You know the super villains, villains and James Bond and Hawaii Five-0. But weirdly, my religious upbringing influenced me as well. There's a lot of religion in my art, even though it's not overt. That is the story of Isaac. If any of you were ever br brought up religiously, you know what that story is about. And the thing that kind of I didn't realize until I was no longer religious is the stories in the Bible are kind of insane in a way, you know? <laughs> This is the story of God going to his prophet and saying, hey, I'm, I'm not sure how, you know, how strong your faith is. Uh, I want you to take your son up on the mountain. I want you to kill him. And Isaac's, or is it Abraham, Isaac? Abraham. Abraham's like, uh, are you sure about that, God? And God's like, yeah, totally sure. Take him up, kill him. And Abraham's like, okay, you're God. You know what you're saying. Come on, Isaac. We're going to take a trip up to the mountain. Go up to the mountain, you know. Abraham's like, uh, God, are you sure about this? God's like, yeah, I'm sure. So Abraham's about to kill his son, and God's like, psych, I'm just kidding. Kill this goat instead. <laughs> so that's what this is about. That's uh, Samson, Samson and Delilah. Samson's in the upper left-hand corner. He's blind. He's about to knock those pillars down and kill everyone in the room. <laughs> and yet, just looking at that, you, you know, I don't think you'd know what it is. That's the first painting I ever got the DJ Skrillex into. He's over at the, the extreme left playing song. That's uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Another biblical story that's kind of fantastic. Um, Lot, who's a religious man, lives in a very wicked city. God sends a couple angels down. Uh, to tell Lot that the city's going to be destroyed. A mob knocks on the door and says, we saw you have some hot angels in there. We want to rape them. And Lot's like, uh, no, you can't rape them. Have my daughters instead. Sends his two daughters out so that the angels don't get raped. Anyway, that's what that's about. I'm sorry if, there's, <laughs> if, if there are people who are currently religious, and I'm, I'm not mocking you. I'm just marveling at these stories and telling you about the the, uh, the fodder they've given me and, and sort of the inspiration for paintings. I did a sh uh, show in New York. Uh, it was all based on the Garden of Eden, or at least my concept of the Garden of Eden. And people, people call my art retro. I hate that word retro because it's kind of dismissive and it also sounds like you have something in your throat. Uh, but this is a painting I can say it is retro. Look at that flip phone. <laughs> in 2007, I went, or 2006, I went to Madrid and went to the Prado Museum and saw the, the Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch, which inspired this piece. His is a triptych, heaven, earth, hell. So I decided to do my own version of heaven, earth, and hell. This was done for the Laguna Art Museum. That, most people would say that's probably heaven. It kind of looks like hell to me. <laughs> you see, see how bored Adam and Eve are? Adam and Eve, they're in Hieronymus Bosch's painting too. Like, what are they doing in heaven? Are they the only, the only two people in heaven? And, but it's the Garden of Eden as well. In the Garden of Eden, all the animals were vegetarians, apparently. 
Look at the look at the lion and the tiger. They can't wait till the fall so they can eat that <laughs> hippo. <laughs> Boredom. This is Earth, which is basically all the vices that make life so fun. <laughs> Looks a little more fun than paradise, I gotta say. And of course, hell, which is where I could really shine. <laughs> Not averse to putting other religions into my art either. It's ancient Greek and Roman mythology. I've done a series of paintings based on those. Pandora's box. But look at that house. Um, Icarus, yeah. The, the centaur, or the, no, the, the minotaur, the bull. The bull appears a lot in my paintings. Another big influence on my art, and you probably all know this, is architecture, especially mid-century modern architecture. Um, I've been lucky enough to be able to tour a lot of these houses just as, as my art has gotten out there and people have seen it. They've invited me to these places. This, this house, actually, uh, the son of the, the original owner invited me over and told me stories about growing up there. In the morning, as soon as they got up, when they were three or four, their mother would put a life jacket on them. <laughs> Seriously. Another view of that same house. Sort of. This is this is actually the most recent print I released. I released it uh, in January. Palm Springs architecture also very influential. That's the Kaufman House. My take on it. Got to have booze in there. <laughs> another another painting of the same house. That's a house in Palm Springs. That's the Elrod house, which was also the supervillain lair in Diamonds Are Forever. So you see it's a coming full circle. The spies and Palm Springs and architecture are all kind of joining together. Or maybe I just arranged my life in such a way that all those things came together. It's a piece based on that house. The owner of that house actually let my wife and I stay there for a weekend. Um, we got to the house. And you see these pictures of the, the main house. What we didn't know is built into the ground underneath the house is a guest wing just as big as the house itself. So we called all our friends in LA and we're like, get out here now. You have a bedroom. <laughs> another painting inspired by that house. It's another view of the house. Frank Lloyd Wright. This is the Ennis House in, in Hollywood. That's a print I did as a preservation for that house. That house was sliding down the hill, and they needed $14 million to shore it up. So they had all sorts of fundraisers. I did that print as a fundraiser. They were able to raise the $14 million. And to shore it up, what they basically did is they dug under the hill, they built a fake steel hill with steel beams, and they covered it over with dirt and planted it. So that means there's this huge cavernous opening under this house, which you know what that means, bat cave. <laughs> it's, I mean, some superhero has to buy this because he's got a built-in bat cave under his house. Anyway, you know, I had been working for about, well, let's see, I had my first show in 96. This is about 2008 or 2009. About 12 years doing kind of the shag thing. The tiki's, the architecture, the drinking, Palm Springs. Enjoying life. And then I kind of had a crisis of confidence as an artist. I felt like what I had been doing was just fluff. And so my art started getting a little darker. This is 2008, 2009, less bright. Uh, these are really big paintings. Uh, I think this one, well, pretty big, six feet across, bigger than what I had been doing before. And I did a series of these paintings, which are less 
influenced by kind of my pop culture obsessions and more kind of trying to do what the surrealist did where I'm pulling stuff out of my subconsciousness, out of my dreams or traumas from my childhood. This is a 2009 show at Corey Helford Gallery in Los Angeles called Autumn's Come Undone. And they did a book with all of these paintings as well. And I thought, yeah, I thought this was what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Even though the gallery told me, like, people like the bright paintings of people at parties better. <laughs> I was like, but I don't. And remember, I, I don't know if you remember, I talked about that artist Coop who had showed at La Luz de Jesus Gallery, who painted naked girls in hot rods. He told me when he saw this stuff, he's like, if you keep painting this stuff, it's going to end badly. <laughs> and I didn't know what he meant. So I persisted. This is a series of paintings I did for a show in uh, Rio, Rio de Janeiro. And then I noticed, well, I tried to make it so all the paintings fit together, almost like a, a sequential comic panel where there's a through line, a river, and, and things that connect them all. And this persisted through three different gallery shows. So there was no way to see all of these paintings together in the same room. And it culminated with that painting in New York. And then I fell through a giant plate glass window in my house and uh, woke up in the hospital, didn't know what had happened. They had to tell me what had happened. I had cut, um, your jugular comes up and it splits off into two arteries. I'd split one of them, so I was still getting blood to my brain through the other one, but I lost about two thirds of, of the blood in my body. Um, and fortunately, my neighbor, I live on a hill, my neighbor who lives above me saw me lying outside in a pool of blood. She called the paramedics and she was a nurse and they saved me. So I don't remember what happened. I just know I'd flown back from London the night before. Uh, um, I hadn't gone to sleep. I had made myself a cocktail at like nine in the morning and decided to start painting. And then the next thing I know, I woke up in the hospital and they had to tell with a tube down my neck and they told me what had happened. Um, and that was like Coop said, if you keep painting like this, it's going to end up badly. <laughs> and that was kind of my, that was my a weird, I've never had electroshock, but I almost liken it to having electroshock. Suddenly my outlook on life was different. I was like, I survived it. I'm alive, you know. And suddenly all that stuff I had been painting before, the, the cocktail parties, the tiki's, that's what I wanted to paint. That's what I wanted to say with my art, you know. The, I wanted to go back to sort of the, where I had been before and I relished it. I relished um, the bright colors, the incongruous scenes, the giant bottles of alcohol. So like I told you, I had a, a drink at 9 a.m. when I fell through that window, which probably should have been a wake-up call to stop drinking. And I used to call drinking career research because so much of my art is based on social drinking. And at some point, I was doing a lot of career research. And at some point, I realized I hadn't painted in two weeks. I had been career researching for two weeks. And at that point, I, I, I had kids, uh, had a daughter who is, well, a daughter in middle school, a son in elementary school. And I was like, wait a minute. I got to get my kids through college. So uh, I'm going to have to stop this drinking thing. So I did a series of paintings and did a show called Pink Elephants. I stopped drinking cold turkey. Until, and I told myself, okay, I'm not going to drink for 10 years. My, my youngest son will be finished with college in 10 years. I'm going to take a 10-year break from drinking. So that was, my, that was kind of my goal. And I was like, well, how do you stop drinking? And I, I thought, well, the first thing you have to do is you have to stop drinking. So I stopped <laughs> drinking. And then after a few days, I hadn't drunk anything. And I was like, well, I guess that's how you stop drinking. So that's how I stopped drinking. 
And uh, it's been five and a half years. My 10 year plan to not drink, I've kind of reassessed actually because I love drinking. It was my favorite thing to do. But uh, it's been going really well without drinking. One of my big fears is when I stop drinking in a social situation, what was I going to do? But all that drinking taught me how to be at a party. So now I can be at a party without drinking and have just as much fun. In fact, more fun sometimes because when I was drinking, it was all about getting the next drink. Now when I'm at a party, it's about, oh, who are you? What do you do? You know, What's going on at this party? So I've kind of, I'm reassessing whether I'm going to start drinking again in four and a half years. But right now, signs say no. Anyway, that pink elephant kind of became my, my little logo guy. I've done a toy of him. It's available at the Shag store. Um, I'm just about to close up, but do you guys know who Paul Williams is? Singer, songwriter from the 70s. Wrote uh, Rainbow Connection. He was popular in the 70s. And he, I have a friend who, uh, he's a brother-in-law of a friend of mine, and he was talking to me once. And he said, he said, Shag, you just have to stick around. Because when you do something good and you stick around for a long time, you become an institution. <laughs> and I was like, hmm? He's like, yeah, just do what you do and keep doing it no matter what happens and you'll become an institution. And I was like, well, thanks, Paul Williams. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know like... Two years later, he'd win Grammy for Be Record of the Year with, with Daft Punk and Pharrell and Nile Rodgers. But there he is two years after he told me about just do what you love and keep doing it. You know, he, he was on the Record of the Year. So I guess that's my ultimate goal as an artist. Just do what I do, keep doing it, do what I love, and eventually I'll be institutionalized. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs>
every issue and got to do their kind of naughty, you know, one panel thing. Huge influence on me, actually. And I did a few of those, not for Playboy. I did those for Blab Magazine. But I would get a whole page and do sort of a risque, funny paddle, panel in homage to those guys. Yeah, definitely. Eldon Dadini, another guy who did those. Um, yeah. Hey, Josh, my name is Raleigh. And I actually met you in Anaheim recently. And you've got some friends that live on my street in Oak, on Oakwood and yeah. Orange. <laughs> So quick question, your, your Paul Williams slide just reminded me of something. I'm a fellow musician, and um, I just started a band with a childhood friend of mine named Robbie Rist, who played Cousin Oliver on The Brady Bunch. And I also have this crazy job. Um, I work on the HBO set Kirby Enthusiasm for Larry David. I worked with him for about 14 years as a stand-in. So my question was, you do a lot of art that's inspired by TV and movies and so on and so forth. Do you always have to get permission or some sort of licensing thing or is it different every time for each particular painting or how does that's that all a work? That's a good question. I, legally an artist can paint whatever they want. Okay. Um, when Andy Warhol and Roy Lichtenstein started painting Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck back in the early 60s, Disney's legal team actually got together and said, hey, you know, these guys are painting Mickey Mouse without permission. What do we do? And word from on high came down and said, let them do it. It elevates the, it elevates the brand. So that set a legal precedent when art, an artist can paint whatever they want. That being said, you can also be sued for anything. You'll win, but you'll get sued. So the attempt is to avoid being sued because then you've got to hire a lawyer, you've got to pay court costs. So that's kind of the gray area where a company could get mad and sue you and it would cost you a bunch of money and eventually you'd prevail. The other thing is now I always get permission just because I'm high profile enough where I'm afraid I'm going to get sued, you know. <laughs> They're not going to sue the little guy working in his bedroom, you know, doing painting Disney princesses or something. Right. But once they think there's a possible payoff, it's it's more attractive to sue. I, I mean, occasionally I'll paint a thing here and there that's not, not, uh, not authorized. Yeah. I did a, a painting recent, or a print recently of, of the rock group Kiss. I had to get permission and pay them a royalty because I knew Gene Simmons would sue me. <laughs> but Paul Lind is in that painting as well. Paul Lind, the comedian who had a Halloween special. I didn't get permission to put him in it. And I was worried Kiss's agent were, was going to say, hey, you got to take him out. We don't have his rights. But I don't think they even knew who he was. So. <laughs> Halloween special probably. Yeah. 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 All right, we have time for one more, one more question. question. Anybody? Uh, love the Stan Lee print and story, of course. Uh, are there other comic book artists who you'd love to team up with, do a similar kind of project? And, you know, who are the comic artists that you grew up uh, reading and, and enjoying? Well, I'm not as versed in the artist as I am in the characters themselves. So like, you know, I, I recently did a, well, it hasn't been released, but I, I did a Guardians of the Galaxy print. You know, I like the property, but I have no idea who came up with Guardians of the Galaxy. So it's kind of more the character versus the artist. I mean, I know, you know, the, the standouts, Jack Kirby, who definitely uh, I revere as, as an artist. Dan Klaus. Do you know Dan Klaus? Sure. I'd love to work with Dan Klaus. Yeah. We're gonna have you draw oh, we're doing a drawing. We're going to do a raffle. And then we're going to get you upstairs. What is this drawing for? Oh. Something from the shed. All right. Do you guys have coupons? Oops. Let's put that one back in there. And 009. Oh, you can't see them. <laughs> I think they're going to turn on the house lights. Zero zero nine, three zero four nine six. Hey, all right. All right. Thanks. Oh, thanks.